Let us pray. Mysterious God, you reveal yourself in Jesus, your beloved child who gives us a glimpse of your glory and invites us to share in the unity of all that is holy. Meet us here today, God, and teach us to be one, one in love, one in grace, one in peace. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. We are dwelling in the peace of the risen Christ, who has called us together. Let's join together now as congregation in singing hymn number 59, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Hymn number 59, let us stand as we sing. Well, good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Having a good day? Yes. What do we do when we pray? What's praying? We're talking to God. What are some things we might talk to God about? Hmm, lots of things, right? Like maybe before we eat, to thank God for the food. Maybe when someone is sick and we want them to get better. Maybe when we're having a good day and we want to thank God for that. 
There are lots of things we can pray about, right? Did you know that Jesus prayed? Jesus prayed a lot. And in our scripture today, he's actually saying a very specific prayer. He's praying for his disciples, but he's, yeah, it's a little Bible. He's praying for his disciples, but he's not just praying for his disciples. I want you to listen to who he's praying for. Yeah, this is my little Bible. It's a good travel Bible. All right? I am not praying just for these followers. I am also praying for everyone else who will have faith because of what my followers will say about me. He wasn't just praying for his disciples. He was praying for everyone that would come after his disciples and believe in him. And do you know who that includes? Us. Exactly right. Jesus prayed for us. Pretty amazing, huh? He prayed. Do you want to hear what he was praying for for us? He said, I want all of them to be one with each other. Now, that's kind of a big idea, being one with each other, but it's kind of the idea that I want them to remember that they are all one big family, that they are connected. Because we all have families, but did you know this is a family right here? You got lots of, it's our church family. You got lots of brothers and sisters and moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, don't you? All in this room. We are all one family. Well, I have a book here I want to read with y'all. It's another way to think about being one. And you know what? There's only three of you. Come sit with me on the steps and look over my shoulder. Come sit with me. Come on. That way you can look at the pictures and I don't have to hold it up. It's an easy book to read? Well, maybe you can read one of the pages. All right? So this book is called Whoever You Are. Can everyone see? All right? Little one, whoever you are, wherever you are, There are little ones just like you all over the world. Their skin may be different from yours, and their homes may be different from yours. Their schools may be different from yours, and their lands may be different from yours. Their lives may be different from yours, and their words may be very different from yours. You wanna take this page? No, never mind. Okay, you're fine. But inside, their hearts are just like yours, whoever they are, wherever they are, all over the world. Their smiles are like yours, and they laugh just like you. Their hurts are like yours, and they cry like you too, whoever they are, wherever they are, all over the world. Little one, when you are older and when you are grown, you may be different, and they may be different wherever you are, wherever they are in this big, wide world. But remember this, joys are the same and love is the same. Pain is the same and blood is the same. Smiles are the same and hearts are just the same. Wherever they are, wherever you are, wherever we are, all over the world. Pretty cool, huh? Let's say a prayer together. God, we thank you that you love every single person. Help us to learn how to love others just as much as you love them. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our anthem this morning is entitled, I Then Shall Live, and it's actually a hymn, number 372 in our hymnals, and I would invite you to follow along. It's a, the text was written by a lady named Gloria Gaither, who many of you may be familiar with. She wrote a lot of texts during the 60s and 70s and 80s particularly. This one is a little bit more recent but it's a lovely text about being forgiven and forgiving, being loved and loving. So if you would like, follow along in your hymnals as we share. The the words in the hymnal are exactly the same as the words that the choir is going to sing. It's a beautiful text. Worship with us as we share, I then shall live.
my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that they all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you have loved me before the creation of the world. May we pray. Our loving God, may we be one. May we be one with your Son, just as he is one with you. May we be one in your love. May they know us through our love and by our love. May we be one in love, not in race, not in gender, not in status, not in political affiliation, and certainly never in judgment. One in love is our prayer, welcoming all, excluding no one. As your son died for all, may we love and accept all. For it's in his name we pray. Let us stand as we sing together our offertory hymn number 547, We Are God's People, hymn number 547.
Let us pray. Loving God, indeed, we come before you today as your people. We come before you today with different pains, with different joys, with different ideas, praying that you can make us one, that you can join us in one purpose, so that in our weakness we may indeed be a cup to hold your grace. Guide us through this portion of our worship service when we give back some of the blessings that you've entrusted to our care. Use them for the furtherment of your kingdom on this earth. These things we pray in Christ. Amen. Hear the words from the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, verses 16 through 18. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I order you, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I made a big mistake my first Mother's Day weekend here in Lumberton. Actually, I made two mistakes. The first mistake was that I waited until the day before Mother's Day to get a card for Sandra. That was a terrible mistake. But then I made things even worse. And that while I did not have a card on the Saturday before Mother's Day, I decided I'd go down to Walmart and get a card for Sandra. Now, I'm thankful that we have a nice Walmart in Lumberton, but take it from me, don't ever go to Walmart in Lumberton on the Saturday before Mother's Day. It is not a place for the faint of heart. It is a place for those who are mildly panicked by their procrastination. And if you happen to go there to look for a Mother's Day card or some flowers, unless you are extremely assertive, you are destined to come out of the place with the card that no one else wanted and flowers that might make it one more day. Big mistake that I made. So men, children, if you haven't gotten your mother a card yet, don't go to Walmart. Make your own card. Go pick some flowers somewhere else and bring them to her. Better yet, if you want a better word of wisdom, what I would suggest you do is bypass the contemporary commercialization of this day and do something for mom that would reflect the true intent or the original intent of Mother's Day. Our Mother's Day celebration is a fine day. We spend this day honoring our mothers and the women in our life. We are thankful for them giving us life and nurturing us along the way. That is certainly a a good thing for us to do. But the original intent of Mother's Day was actually a bit different. It was actually set in place, or the beginnings of Mother's Day were set in place back in the 1800s by two women. I don't know if Julia Ward Howe and Ann Jarvis knew each other, but they shared a common interest. They shared a common purpose. Julia Ward Howe was a native of New York. She grew up in New York City. She grew up in some degree of privilege and spent most of her life, her, I believe, 90-some years, writing and also promoting and encouraging the women's suffrage movement. She was a prolific writer, and actually she is most well known for having written the words to the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Ann Jarvis, on the other hand, grew up in northern Virginia. She did not grow up in privilege. In fact, she experienced a tremendous amount of tragedy in life. We're not exactly sure how many children she had. The thought is around 12 children. But of those 12 children, only four of them survived into adulthood. She lost eight children to disease, to things like smallpox and typhoid. Jarvis was able to redeem some of the grief, though, that she experienced in life by putting herself to work to try to help the needs of others. She was devoted in the mid-1800s to traveling around the region of northern and western Virginia and promoting good health practices and sanitation. She also formed what she called Mother's Day Work Club. And these Mother's Day work clubs would go from town to town and teach families and whole communities about good hygiene and sanitation and how to take care of their families to to help raise their children in in a healthy way. And then in the 1860s, as you know, war broke out in our country, the Civil War And well, Ann Jarvis saw that as as an opportunity to fill another need. 
She and her Mother's Day work club set themselves to caring for wounded soldiers. It didn't matter if they were of the Confederacy or if they were of the Union. It made no difference whatsoever. She gave herself to mending the wounds of those who had been injured in battle or others who had become sick with disease. At one point in the course of the war, there was a typhoid epidemic that came about in that area, and Ann Jarvis and her Mother's Day work clubs opened their clinics and their field hospitals to any and all, blue uniform or gray uniform, didn't matter, all were welcome to receive healing. She was criticized for helping both sides, but she saw it as a cause that was greater than just her national loyalty. She saw it as a mandate from her God to be a person of peace and encouraging others to practice and to live out peace. And once the war was over in 1865, she realized that people were still angry with one another. A great deal of hostility between those in the North and the South. And living right there in northern Virginia, she saw the opportunity to advance the cause of peace. So she put together what she called a Mother's Friendship Day. She would invite people, both from the north that she knew and both from the south that she knew, and have them come together. And there was a good amount of criticism for this idea. No one, or I'm not sure that no one, but folks did not think it was a great idea. But she was persistent. And so at some point in the year of 1868, Ann Jarvis had the Mother's Friendship Day. And there were speeches about peace and reconciliation. And there was a band that played, and at one point the band played Dixie, and then they played the Star Spangled Banner. Music from the South as well as music from the North. And then at the end of the day, Everyone stood together and sang Old Lang Syne. History doesn't tell us if Julia Ward Howe was at Mother's Friendship Day. She was in New York. She may not have even known about it. But something prompted her to continue the cause of peace. Not only did she advance women's suffrage, the right to vote, but she also was a voice for peace in our nation, and all over the world. So in 1870, she issued what she called a Mother's Day Proclamation. It's a nice little essay, about three paragraphs long, and the last sentence of the Mother's Day Proclamation is a beautiful summary of everything she said. She said, Let us then solemnly take counsel with each other as to the means whereby the great human family can live in peace. Man as the brother of man, each bearing after his own kind the sacred impress, not of Caesar, but of God. Let us figure out, she says, how we can live in peace. How humanity can live together. How we can look past our differences. Respecting our distinctives. Respecting our points of view. But let us look past those and to recognize that we are all made with a sacred impress. We are all made in the creation of God. And let us live in peace, she says. That's the origin of Mother's Day. A day where we inspire mothers, but everyone, to live peacefully together. Now Jesus, according to John, did not use the flowery language of a Julia Ward Howe. But in the prayer that we read from John 17, the sentiment is the same. Jesus is praying for peace. He is praying for unity. You may recognize that the portion of Scripture that we have read is actually the third part of a three-part prayer that Jesus prays in the moments before his arrest and trial. He prays first for himself that the Lord would glorify himself through what was about to happen. And then he prays for the disciples. And then in the portion that we have just read, Jesus 
looks down the road of time and he prays for everyone who will come to believe in him because of the witness, because of the testimony of the disciples. Now, it's amazing to me that Jesus would do that, and you would think that there would be a long list of attributes and blessings that Jesus would pray for us in this moment. He could have prayed for the strength of our faith. He could have prayed for the courage of our testimony. He could have prayed that we would persevere through difficult times. But Jesus takes this crucial moment in his life, and he prays for our unity. He prays for peace. He prays that we would be one. You see, Jesus understood the importance of unity. He understood that no one, no one wants to be a part of division or dissension. No one wants to be a part of a church or a team that is always arguing with one another. No one wants to be a part of a group that will not listen to one another. No one wants to be a part of any type of organization that is comprised of people who always think that they are right and insist on having their own way. Jesus understood the importance of unity. He understood what Mr. Trump and Secretary Clinton are going to need to learn very quickly. Over the past several months, Mr. Trump and Secretary Clinton have proven themselves to be savvy politicians who have been able to win votes and win the, the, the majority of those within their respective parties. But now both of them face the task of bringing their parties together. We have heard over this past few days that they are both tasked with uniting their parties and they understand that the one who is able to unite their parties best will indeed be the 43rd president or the next president of our country. Unity wins elections. And unity wins people to the kingdom of God as well. That's why Jesus prays this in this moment. He knows that the future of the work that he has started depends on our unity. Now, Jesus prayed this prayer 2,000 years ago. And the folks like Julia Ward Howe and Ann Jarvis and many, many others, has helped the cause of peace and unity. But what is the state of our unity today? If we ask that question of our nation, I I think we would all have to admit that our nation is divided in many ways, not only amongst Democrats and Republicans, but there are divisions within socioeconomic dimensions. And there are certainly disheartening divisions within the races as well. There is great dissension within our nation. And not only will our next president need to be one who can unite his or her party, but will need to be one who will need to unite the United States. That's a prayer that we must offer for our leaders. But still, let's remember that this prayer that Jesus is praying here is not for any one nation. He's not praying for Israel, and he's certainly not praying for the United States here. Rather, Jesus is praying for all who will come to believe as a result of the disciples' words. Jesus is praying for the household of faith here. He's praying for you and me. He's praying for our brothers and sisters across the street and across town. He is praying for all of us who gather in churches on this Lord's day to worship God through Christ. He is praying that we would be united together. Actually, though, my translation actually doesn't use the word united Some translations do, the the New International Version does. The translation that I use, the New Revised Standard, does not use the word united, but rather it uses a different word. It uses one. 
I pray, Lord, that they will be one. Please forgive me if it sounds like I'm just playing semantics here or if I'm splitting hairs, but I see a, a little bit of a difference between united and one. United is a noble ideal. It is a good thing. We want to be united, but, but being united means that we come together and we acknowledge each of us have our own differences and our own perspectives, but we work together for a common good. In the church, as we see unity here in our congregation, is we are united in that we join with our friends at Chestnut Street and First Presbyterian and Asbury United Methodist. We come together and we have a worship service during Holy Week. Or we unite with our friends at Godwin Heights and we have a day of missions with Operation Inasmuch in September. Those are, those are good days and good moments when we Remember the fact that we aren't just Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist or Pentecostal, but rather we are first and foremost Christian. We are followers of Christ. That's unity, and that's a good thing. The church needs unity, but I believe unity is actually just a step towards what Jesus is praying here. He says, I pray that they may be one. To be one is to acknowledge that we have differences, that we are not all the same in many ways. But to be one is to look past those appearances and those differences. To be one is to set aside liberal versus conservative, fundamentalist versus progressive, to set all of that aside and to recognize that when it comes down to who we really are, when you parse out all of our differences, we are all souls in need of God. To be one is to recognize, to pause, and to see the sacred impress that Julia Ward Howe spoke of. And to see that every person in this room and in that room and in that room and everywhere else are all children of the living God. And not only those of us who gather in churches on this Mother's Day, but everyone who is walking and breathing today. It is to see every living soul as a child of God and to value them as such. Now, in the passage that I read from Acts 16, I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening at all. Luke tells us that he, along with Paul and Silas, are in a region known as Thyatira. And they are preaching the word and letting everyone know of the good news of Jesus Christ. And there's a young girl who sees Paul and Silas, and she kind of latches on to them. And she starts following them everywhere they go. Now, this isn't just any ordinary young girl. This is a slave girl. And she's enslaved because she has a special power, a, a, a spirit of divination, Luke says. She can tell the future. She's a fortune teller. And people are paying good money to be able to hear what their fortune or their future holds. And her masters are just raking in the money. It's a good, it's a good thing for them. But this young girl latches on to Paul and starts announcing to everyone, This man has come to tell you that there's a way of salvation. He is a servant of the living God. And that may not sound all that bad at first, but day after day after day, everywhere you go, this young girl is behind him and she's making quite a scene. She's very distracting. And so Luke says Paul gets much annoyed, very frustrated with her. And so in a moment of frustration and anger, he turns around and says, by the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And just like that, 
the Spirit is gone. In that hour, Luke says, the girl is set free from this Spirit. Now, we might read that passage and think, praise be to God. The spirit of divination, this this evil spirit, is out of this poor girl, and she has now been set free. This is a good thing, and it is a good thing as to what happened. I, I think it's a good thing. The thing is, we don't know what happened to this girl. What happened to her? Where did she go? We would like to think now that she has been set free from this spirit, now she is set free also from her masters who are enslaving her, and now she can return home and live happily ever after. Maybe she can meet the man of her dream someday and get married and have a family and all will be well, and and that would be wonderful, but we simply don't know what happened to her. It may also be that she was an orphan in the first place. And now that she's not bringing in any money for her masters, they don't have any use for her. So maybe they just cut her loose. She's going to have to live the rest of her days out on the streets. And instead of, spell it, and instead of selling fortunes, maybe she's going to have to sell her body to be able to have something to eat. We just don't know. You see, the angst that I feel with this story is that Paul didn't pause long enough to see that this slave girl was a child of God. Yes, he healed her in the name of Jesus Christ, but he did so out of frustration. And I know there are people that frustrate us at times. But perhaps instead of just wishing we could cast the demon out of them or washing our hands of them, perhaps we need to pause for just a moment and to see and to experience the sacred impress with which they were created. I don't know what happened to this girl. And you can look through the rest of the book of Acts and you can look anywhere you want. You won't find her story anywhere else. She just fades from view. But you know, I'm quite sure that she's still out there. She's still out there. And, And even though Paul is done with her, She belongs to us now, and she's our responsibility. We may not go out and cast any demons out of her, but maybe if we will pause from day to day and listen and watch and notice the people around us, maybe we'll find it. Maybe we'll be able to help her. Maybe we'll not only be able to pray for her, but we'll be able to pray with her. And if we do that, I think we will discover that she or he is not just an acquaintance or a neighbor or a co-worker. They are a human being. Made in the image of God made with the same sacred impress that you and I have been created in. And that we will understand that that person, whom society seems to have just thrown away, they belong to us. And we belong to them. Mother Teresa once said, if we don't have peace, it's because we have forgotten that we belong to one another. Folks, you belong to me, and I belong to you. And there are millions and millions of people beyond these walls who belong to us, 
and to whom we belong as well. So let's remember. Let's remember to pause and to see that sacred impress and to know that we belong to one another. Let's pause and notice and listen and care and give the help that we can give. And in doing so, I think we will go a long way towards answering Jesus' Mother's Day prayer. Let us pray together. Lord, each person that we see is made in your image. You know them better than they know themselves. You know us better than we know ourselves. Lord, help us to seek to live the prayer for unity, the prayer to be one, by stepping out of our own lives, by listening, by offering our hearts, by offering the compassion that is within our ability to offer. Help us to value life, O Lord. For it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 626. O God of every nation, will you please stand with me as we sing and respond to God's grace. I would ask that you keep the Lula Williams family in your prayers over the next few days. Ms. Williams passed away yesterday morning. There will be a graveside service for her on Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock at the Meadowbrook Cemetery. So please keep the Williams family in your prayers. <laughs> 